So as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, I'm a designer and professional art artist, and what that means is it does for so many artists is that I often also work a day job. Um, but the, the specific area of art form that I'm most involved in is mechanical special effects. And uh, as she kind of illustrated, uh, the easiest way to describe that is I make a lot of weird, nerdy gadgets, mostly for use in doing things like puppeteering monster suits for very low-budget horror films and that kind of stuff. Um, but through that, it led to me becoming involved in the design process for 3D printed mechanical finger prosthetics. And that's the, the story that I'm gonna share with you today as to how that all sort of happened. The, the process through which I ended up getting involved in mechanical uh, printed prosthetics via special effects is really linked to that very strange, uh, almost stream of consciousness nature of the internet. It's that same phenomenon that I, I'm sure most of us in this room have experienced at least one point in time where you can start by reading some of Walt Whitman's poetry online, and then a few clicks later you suddenly find yourself inexplicably inundated by pictures of a grumpy cat. Um, so not exactly that same process, but uh, quite a while ago as a personal project, I built a uh, large metal mechanical puppet hand which hooks to the forearm and is uh, controlled via cables which are looped around the fingertips. I decided to share a video of this on YouTube, and much to my surprise, it actually got some views. Uh, but was, what was more surprising than that was an email that I received. The email was from a man named Richard Van Oss in South Africa. He's a absolutely brilliant artist and woodworker, and uh, unfortunately, he lost four fingers from his right hand in an accident. He had seen my video online and was wondering if we could uh, collaborate with one another to try and come up with some sort of design for homebrewed mechanical finger prosthetics. This was a very large task for two guys operating from their garages separated by 10,000 miles, but we figured it was at least worth exploring. So through some crowdfunding, uh, we were able to, produce, uh, to purchase some tools and materials to get started, and initially we explored this process utilizing essentially basic shop equipment. As things progressed and we started to develop the design, we were approached by a woman named Yolandi, who also lives in South Africa. She had heard about what it was that we were trying to accomplish and reached out. Her son Liam was born without any fingers on his right hand, and she was interested to see if we might be able to develop something that could assist people like him as well. We knew that this posed a significant challenge because anything that we designed and built for him, he would quickly grow out of. But regardless of that, we decided to explore that at the same time. Around the same point in time, a coworker of mine at my day job suggested to me that we look into 3D printing as a way to lower the cost of components. Now, up to that point, I knew that 3D printing existed, but honestly, I didn't have much knowledge outside of that. Um, in its early days, it was, a very it was a very expensive and therefore very inaccessible technology. So we hadn't really considered applying it to our project. But when we went online and found companies like MakerBot, we discovered that there were actually consumer level 3D printers available now. And the implications of that blew me away. What it meant is that if we could develop a design that was printable, it would be possible to rescale and reprint that design as Liam grew, essentially making it possible for his device to grow with him. This could potentially lead to a solution to one of the greatest challenges of fitting children with a device of that nature. So along with the uh, kind of serendipitous way in which this, progress, this project had progressed, I decided to give it a try and send MakerBot an email. I let them know what we were up to and asked if they'd be willing to help in any way or even provide us with a machine or two to use. Now, I saw this as quite a long shot. Emailing a company and saying, hey, we're two random guys with a kind of out there idea. We have no background in this field. We have no credentials. And will you please send us two of your very high-tech machines for free? <laughs> um, much to our surprise and delight, however, they responded extremely positively. They were supportive and encouraging of what it was that we were trying to accomplish. And they even offered to provide us with two of their printers to attempt to develop the design. When the printers arrived, it was an incredible thing. We, we were able to print out the same component, get on video chat, 
and then while holding the same object, even though we were so far apart, look at it, explore, think of different things to do, brainstorm, and then make those changes, email each other the files, and then reprint and start the process over again. It was an incredible boost to the speed of the design process, uh, much along the lines of uh, stepping out of a horse-drawn carriage and then immediately hopping into a Formula One racer. Um, and in a relatively short period of time, we had our first prototype that we could print and have Liam test. And then we took the design files for that prototype and uploaded them to Thingiverse for free so that other people could download the, the files, hopefully um, use, assemble, explore, and innovate, and then build upon the initial work that we had created. And as time has gone on, there have even been individuals who have succeeded in building this device themselves at home. I know of two father and son teams uh, here in the United States. Um, over in Massachusetts, there's Paul and Leon. And actually here in the Pacific Northwest, there is Peter and Peregrine. And both of these father and son teams were able to gain access to a printer, print out the components, and then assemble a version of the device themselves at home for less than $50 in materials cost. Uh, P P uh, both Peregrine and Leon were born like Liam. They're missing fingers from one of their hands. And they've both expressed that it's been a very exciting thing to be able to build that with their fathers. And beyond that, they've actually become collaborators in the design process now. Through the experiences that they had in building this at home, they've thought of ways that there could be improvements in function, and also ways that the design could be changed to make it easier for other people to accomplish what they accomplished in their homes. And what this really illustrates is that this is truly just the beginning of this concept. It's brought a lot of people on board, and there are now many people collaborating to improve the design from many different places. Already, the design incorporates some excellent improvements from designers like Michael Curry from MakerBot and Chris Chappelle from the Anthromod Project, among others. Moving forward, John Scholl from the Rochester Institute of Technology has founded a Google Plus group called Enable, that's E hyphen Enable, for the purpose of creating a space for designers, engineers, medical professionals, and those in need of the device to all come together and collaborate and think of ways to move this concept forward. There's even a team from Creighton University that has jumped into the group, and they have plans to research the device from a perspective of medical safety, function, and then ways to hopefully improve and increase access for those that could benefit from it. Being a part of this process has been an incredible journey. And through it, I learned two very important things as far as what the two central components were that led to it being possible to take this idea and translate it into a reality. And those two components were consumer level 3D printing in combination with the open source design process. Consumer level 3D printing has given rise to a means for independent designers to quickly and in a very cost effective way test out their ideas in the real world. In some applications, and mechanical fingers for children is just one example, it's even possible for these designs to be ready for use in the real world right after coming off of the printer. As a tool for open source development, this makes it possible for people from a very wide range of backgrounds and experience levels to collaborate with one another. You can have everyone in the mix from people with their PhDs in material science to people that are tinkering in their garage. It's also an excellent tool for educators to teach the principles of design and engineering to their students who will become the next generation of innovators. Already here in Washington State, the Washington State Mesa Foundation is actively exploring how to incorporate 3D printing and 3D design into their, into their project-based curriculum. And my hope is that we will see many more organizations and ed educational institutions doing something similar as time moves forward. More than anything, being involved in this process has led me to imagine. If two people on opposite sides of the planet from their garages can use this technology as a vehicle to create a share an, and share an idea, which then blossoms into a small community who is working to find ways to create a large positive impact, imagine the possibilities as more and more people become involved and begin exploring what this technology can do. It can serve as a, as a new tool with which we can reach out and help our neighbor. And our neighbor can now be someone who lives thousands of miles away. 
I greatly appreciate your time and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today.